you know, like, like for me, uh, I lost both my parents. My mom was, I was probably about 35 when my mom died and I was like 25 when my dad died. And, uh, it's, that's kind of young. And I always thought, why in the world do they have to die so young, man? Um, I barely had any relationship with my dad cause he was an alcoholic and, uh, the, we got married and then I had a good relationship for about a year and then he passed away and I just, instead of sitting there questioning God on all this stuff, I just started thanking him because there's a lot of times that, I mean, there's people that didn't have, didn't have that year to bond with their dad. You know what I mean? Because me and him used to just go drinking together and then we'd get in arguments and, and that was, our, that was our together time, right? Or when I was young, he would go to take me to the bar and pass out and they'd call my mom to come pick me up because my dad had passed out at the bar. <laughs> and, uh, but that was, I mean, all our friends, my friends would go hang out and uh, drink pop and peanuts and play pool and that you just went to the bar with your parents when you were young. Um, but uh, for me, it just, it makes me realize how we focus on that and we don't focus on anything else in life. We focus on the bad and that's, as humans, I think that's what we do. Um, when you got stuff going on at work, do you remember, when you get home, do you remember the good stuff from work or the bad stuff from work? You remember the bad stuff, right? When you're growing, when you're, uh, you grow up and you think back to your, your past, your childhood, you remember the good stuff or the bad stuff? <laughs> See, and it's, well, <laughs> like for me, it's weird. I don't remember much of my, of my childhood. It's like I zoned out on it or something. I wasn't even doing drugs then, so I don't know. <laughs> but, uh. I know for me, though, it's sometimes it's hard that to uh, focus on what God's doing in your life instead of all the bad stuff that's going on, right? Um, what we focus on, we empower. Okay, so don't think about no pink elephants. Don't think about any images of Dummo out of your mind. You can fix your thoughts on anything. Just don't think about any large, tough-skinned, Pachyderms. Pause briefly and then ask what happened. What were you focused on? <laughs> so, that's just normal, right? For 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 us, we when somebody tells us not to do it, and that's exactly what we do. When you go out to eat and somebody tells you, "Don't touch this plate; it's hot." What do you do? <laughs> How hot is it? <laughs> um. And then what is an offense? What is your definition of an offense? Anybody? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And somebody's rude? Uh, impossible to avoid? Okay. Sister, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so the definition here is uh, offense is a breach of a law or rule or an illegal act. Annoyance or resentment brought on by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. Does that sound about right? Um, think, let's think about it, church. When we... We, the reason we uh, see offenses is because in somewhere in our lives, we think there's a rule that you, people can't do this, this, and this, right? Because we have rights. But in the Bible, anywhere, did Jesus have any rights? He didn't, right? And that's come he wasn't offended. But in our minds, we have this, they can't do this, they can't do this, they can't do this. So we get offended when somebody does something that we don't like, right? The greatest hindrance to a Christian is rights because we perceive that we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to do this. We shouldn't have to do this. This people should do this for me. I should do this, right? Because we feel that, that we are entitled to that. Man, the Bible doesn't say anything about us being entitled to anything. Amen. 
It says we're entitled to heaven if what? We die to self. Amen? But in our minds, imagine if we didn't have... It's like I was listening to this guy one day. He said in Cuba, the worst thing that could happen in Cuba is people get liberated out there. Because the minute people get liberated out there, they don't have any need for God anymore. Amen? That's exactly what happened in America. The minute we have rights and we can do this and we can do that and you can do this, we forget all about God because we have rights. We're Americans. Amen? What kind of rights do we have as Americans? We have tons of rights, right? What kind of rights do we have as Christians? We have no rights. Right? But we don't like that. And that's where people fall away from the gospel, fall away from God because they want to have rights. They think they... they are something, are somebody. And in all reality, church, we're not. Amen? <laughs> um, we're going to go over a couple stories. The first one is, uh, watch, let me read this real fast. Oh, I'll do it here. We live in a society that has increasingly become defined by the struggle for rights and access to the public square. The latter half of the 12th century witnessed the watershed of civil rights movement, which was defined contemporary America up to this point. The civil rights movement continues to branch out into other areas of rights, orientation, gay rights, animal rights, environmental rights. The United States of America has seen the transformation of its culture by the legal, social, and political ramifications of the rights movement in various forms. Several years ago, we were on a promotional trip for Christian schools to Washington, D.C. to learn more of the Christian heritage of the United States. It is noteworthy on how much American history and culture is conditioned by the Christian background of our original colony ancestors. One day, we were getting ready on the tour bus, and a lady was holding forth on how the rights of Christians were being trampled by the government. She was discussing how Christians should influence politics in order to protect their rights. In response, I retorted that Christians do not have rights. This completely took her aback, and she left without a response. This in incident illustrates the truth that Christians do not have civil rights, that Christians do not have civil rights as Christians. We have rights as American citizens. However, often Christians protest against discrimination as Christians rather than American citizens. Amen. We forget who we're supposed to be, right? We get so caught up on our rights and how we're going to do this, this, and this that we forget that what? We got to die to self. Let me show you guys some scriptures here. <laughs> yeah. Galatians 20 or 220. <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ. In him I have shared his crucifixion crucifixion. It is no, no longer I who live, but Christ, the Messiah, who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith, adherence to, and reliance on the complete trust in the Son of God, whom loved me and gave himself up for me. Amen. We're going to go a couple more on these and go real fast, and I'll read them out of here. Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Galatians 5.24 And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. John 12.24 Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Amen. Church, when we die to self, we, we give up who we perceive we need to be or who we perceive we should be, God can do so much more in our lives. Amen. 
But when we hold on to what we believe and what we think, we're limiting what God can do. Amen. Because us is getting in the way of him. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we're going to go over two different stories here. Um, let's go to First Chronicles 27.33. Yeah, this is a this kind of ties into the rest of it, but oh, okay. is that the right place? yeah. Twenty seven thirty three. Yeah. Wanna read that, Mike, or you don't know that word either? Uh, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Ahithophel was the king's counselor. Hashiah the Ar Archai was the king's companion and friend. So Ahithophel was David's trusted counselor. Amen. He was his most one of his most trusted servants. He did he was went everywhere with him. He was always telling him this is what God says. I spoke to God for you. This is what's happening. This is what we need to do. He was the person when David had a, to get an answer from God, that's who David went to. Amen. Uh, let's go to 2 Samuel uh, 1623. And the counsel of Ahipothel in those days was as if a man had con consulted the word of God, so was all of Ahipothel's counsel considered both by David and Absalom. Amen. You guys remember who Absalom was? No. So Absalom was David's uh, son that betrayed him and tried to take the kingdom from him. Okay, he got a, was upset with some stuff that happened when they, he was a child and stuff. And he uh, ended up leaving for years and came back to the kingdom. And David accepted him back. And, uh, and he started hanging out in the kingdom again and stuff. We'll read a little bit now. Uh, 2 Samuel 15. 1 to 12. After this, Absalom got a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And he rose up early and stood beside the gateway. And when any man who had controversy came to the king for judgment, Absalom called to him, Of what city are you? And he would say, the servant of such and such tribe of Israel. Okay, so Absalom had left. He was mad at his father. He came back. He made amends with him, but he was still offended. Okay, so this is something that went on for year, well, for months, for years, that where he was conceiving a plan to get back to his father, at his father. Um, go to verse 3. Absalom would say to him, your claims are good and right, but there is no man appointed as the king's agent to hear you. Absalom added, Oh, that I were a judge in the land, then every man with any suit or cause might come to me and I would do him justice. What's he doing? He's undermining the kingdom, right? He's undermining his dad. He's undermining the king. And whenever a man came near to do obstinance to him, he would put his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And for four years, Absalom said to the king, I pray you, let me go, after four years, I pray you, let me go to Hebron, his birthplace, and pay my vow to the Lord. For your servant vowed, while I dwell in Gesar, in Syria, that if the Lord would bring me again to Jerusalem, then I would serve the Lord by offering a sacrifice. And the king said to him, Go in peace. And he arose and went to Hebron. 
But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, and say, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. Go to verse 12. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. When Absalom went, 200 men from Jerusalem and who were invited as guests of the sacrificial feast, and they went in their simplicity. And they knew not a thing. They didn't even know what was going on, right? He already had a plan. And when, while Absalom was offer, offer, offering sacrifices, he sent for Ahipothal, the Gilead, David's counselor from his city in Gola. And the conspiracy was strong, and the people, the people with Absalom increased continually. So he sent counselor. Why would he send for David's counselor if this guy was so ingrained with what David was doing and he was his, uh, one of his chosen servants? You think there was some talking going on? Right? Just like in the church, you, right? you see people that are offended with this or offended with that, they get together and they start talking in the corners. And when something happens... They find the people that are the familiar spirit and they call When a church has a division or something, there'll be people that are in this part of the group and there's people in this part of the group and they stay away from each other and it becomes like a little click here, a little click here because you're not going to bring somebody into your group if you're back if you're talking bad about pastor and somebody's going to correct you, right? Or you're not going to bring somebody into your group that is, all they're going to do is talk bad about pastor because you're going to stop them and they're not going to like it. Amen? Um, you're not going to bring somebody into a group that's going to talk bad about somebody in the church, right? Because you know what? There's a lot of things that can happen in everybody's life, but it doesn't mean that we can hold that stuff in and make a division here. Look, Absalom went... And he found somebody to talk to. And he was already conspiring this plan for four years. Amen? Um, so a while back, we had like a, a split here in the church. And uh, I got offended because nobody invited me. To them, so, <laughs> <laughs> But I talked to Chris Clark. And he said, maybe next time. <laughs> So, oh, I'm hopeful. <laughs> um, but so, but th you're not going to invite somebody that's not going to tell you what you want to hear, right? So that's what happens, churches. You got to be thankful when somebody don't invite you because they already know where you stand. Amen. I know when I was in the home, people would leave, and they, nobody could leave by themselves. Everybody would have to find one or two people to go with them. And when they'd find the one or two people, then they'd take off. When I was, uh, was a little bit after I was in the home, there was these two kids that were in high school, and we'd go pick them up at the high school and take them and stuff. And So one day, uh, this guy that was in the home, he was <laughs> one of the drivers, he picked one of them up, and he was going to go to the other school to pick up the other one. He's like, dude, it's on, it's already, you're busted because uh pastor found out about your scheme and stuff. And he was just messing with the kid's head. It was actually a fact that they were scheming about how they were going to get out of the home together. Huh? So he, like, spilled his guts and everything. <laughs> he told him the whole story, and he's like, man, I was just messing with you, dude. <laughs> But you know what? When you're guilty, that's what happens, right? You, you're going to speak God. So let's go to uh, 2 Samuel 11.3. So it's still weird that you, Hippothal would take off with Absalom and betray David, don't you think? David sent, so remember with what happened with David and Bathsheba? Right? So David sent and inquired with, about the woman. He said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, 
the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Let's go to uh, 2 Samuel 23, 24. Asaphal, brother of Joab, was one of the 30. And Elian, son of De du Dudu, was of Bethlehem. <laughs> I guess Dudu, huh? <laughs> uh, Dodo, Dodo, we'll go with Dodo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The other part of the verse, Pastor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Samra of Herod, Iliaka of Herod. Sheesh. <laughs> Let's see if this is the right one. 23, First Samuel. Second, no, no, it's, it's Second Samuel. It's supposed to be 24. Let me see here. 24? Yeah. Yeah, verse 24. <laughs> Go to uh, King, uh, New King James. Let's see if it's a different. Second Samuel. No, I, I had it here somewhere. I'm looking for, uh, what's his name, Mom? Ahipathal's name in there. Okay, Second Samuel. I told you Second Samuel 23, 24, or 34, I'm sorry. 23, 34. Okay, Eliath, the son of Azabai, and the son of Malachi, Eliam, the son of Ahipathal, the Gileanite. So Eliam was who? After laughing, Eliam was the father of who? Of Bathsheba. So Bathsheba was Ahipathal's granddaughter. So when all this was happening with Bathsheba and David, Ahipathal had a front row seat to all of it. And he defiled his granddaughter. And he killed his, uh, his, uh, his basically his family, right? He took out his whole bloodline. Amen. So he held that in. And he still did what he had to do, and he still did this, he still did that in the kingdom, but he held this offense. Yeah. Now, huh? Oh, Ahipathal? Ahipathal was uh, the grandfather of uh, Bathsheba. So if you go back to... Uh, he was mad at David, yeah. So if you go back to uh, um, 2 Samuel 11.3, remember that name, I Ilium. <coughs> so David sent and inquired of the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Amen. So all this time, he was still doing what he had to do in the kingdom, but he was holding on to something. And he was holding on to this, holding on to this, and when opportunity came, he turned on him. Amen. Uh, Go to 2 Samuel 16, 15. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the people, the people of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahipathel was with them. And, he, and so it was when Hashiah, the 
actually like David's friend came to Absalom, that Hashiah said to Absalom, long live the king, long live the king. So Absalom said to Hashiah, is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? So everybody's leaving David, right? <laughs> They're going to go hang out with Absalom. <laughs> and Hishiah said to Absalom, no, but whom the Lord and his people and all the men of Israel choose, his I will be, and I will, be with, and I will remain with him. Furthermore, whom sh should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? And I have served in your father's presence, so I will be in your presence. And Absalom said to Ahipothel, give advice to, to what we should do. And Ahipothel said to Absalom, go in your in concubines, left to keep his house, and all Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father. And the hands of all who are with you will be strong. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house, and Absalom went, to all, went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. You see the justice being served now? You see uh, Ahipothel getting justice? He's advising the, the new king now to do exactly what he wants him to do. And he's shaming David as much as he possibly can. Amen. Um, church, when we let st stuff like this go, that little offense becomes bitterness. And bitterness takes us to some places we don't want to be. Amen. Um, 2 Samuel 17, 1. Moreover, Ahipothel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will rise, arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. Then I will bring him, all the people back to you. When all return except the man whom you seek, all the people will be, be at peace. And the saying pleased Absalom and the elders of Israel. So he is still seeking vengeance, right? He's going to go and kill him now. And he had the blessing of all of Israel. But Absalom, he hated his father, right? He was ready to take the... Absalom finally got like a sense of, uh, maybe I should ask somebody else. <laughs> so, uh, and Absalom said, now call Hishai the ark, Archite, and let us hear what he says too. And when Hirsha came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahipothel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do what he says? If not, speak up. So Hishai said to Absalom, The advice that Ahipothel has given is not good at this time. For, said Hishai, You know your father and his men, and they are mighty men. And they are enraged in their minds like a bear robbed of the cubs in the field. And your father is a man of war and will not camp with the people. Surely by now he is hidden in some pit or in some other place. And it will be when some of them were overthrown at first that whoever hears this will say, there is a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And even... He, he who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. Therefore I advise that all Israel be fully gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba, like the sand is by the sea for a multitude, and that you may go to battle in person. So we will come upon him in some place where we may be found and we will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground and all of him and all the men and all who are with him there shall not be left so much as one. Moreover, if he has withdrawn from, into a city, then all Israel shall bring ropes to that city and we will pull it into the river until there is no, not one small stone found there. 
So Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the advice of Hishai the Archi is better than the advice of Ahipathal. For the Lord had purposed the defeat of the good advice of Ahipathal. And to the, to the intent that the Lord might bring dis, disaster on Absalom. Then Hishai said to Zadok and Abdenar, the priests, thus, <coughs> and so Ahipathal advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus, so I have advised. Now, therefore, send quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend a night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily across over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. Let's see here. So he got two different uh, words of advice. And uh, he ended up following uh, Husha's advice. Um, let's go to, go, go to verse 18. Let's go to Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom, but both of them went away quickly and came to a man's house in Bariam. And while in the court, they went down into it. I can't find it here. There's a scripture. What are we on? 17. Verse 23. Now when Ahipathal saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and hanged himself and died. He was buried in his father's tomb. This is the first time in the Bible that it talked about suicide. Um... So where did all that resentment and anger and bitterness and offense take him? Took him to the grave, right? Where is all that anger and bitterness and offense going to take us? Going to take us to the grave. Now, we'll read a better story now. <laughs> We're going to go through uh, some of Joseph's life life let's go to uh genesis 50 19 through 20 Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about at is, at is, as it is this day to save many people alive. Joseph went through a whole lot of stuff in his life, but in all of the stuff that he went through, he focused on God. Ahipathal didn't focus on God and everything that he went through, right? So I just wanted to show you guys two different versions of where, what, when stuff is coming against you, how there, you can have two totally different perspectives on it, right? Um, in the first chapter, we grouped all offended people into two major categories. Number one, those who have been genuinely mistreated. And number two, those who think that they've been mistreated but actually are not. In this chapter, I want to address the first category. So, was uh, Ahipathal generally, genuinely mistreated? I think it was wrong what happened. He might not have been mis mistreated, but his family was, right? Um, was 
Joseph genuinely mistreated? Okay, so they both had a case on why they did that shouldn't have happened to it in, the, in their lives, right? <coughs> um, David, for the, I mean, Joseph, for the most part, his uh, brothers took him and uh, sold him into slavery because of the dreams that he was having, and they were sick of listening to him, and he was the favorite, and they didn't want the favorite around, right? Um, so they took him and they uh, were going to kill him. They weren't going to kill him, but they were going to sell him into slavery. So imagine you're part of this wealthy family with a whole bunch of brothers, and they take you and slave, put, sell you as a slave. So now your whole bloodline is going to be known as slaves. Everything that you knew has went away, and now you are living a new life. Amen? Just like Jesus, right? Jesus gave everything up in heaven and came to earth. Amen. He ta- asked us, God asked us to give up a little bit and we're ready to backslide, right? Um, but you look at what Joseph gave, what Joseph gave away, what Jesus gave away, and we can't sit there and tell God that we shouldn't have to give something away, right? Um, Joseph was Jacob's 11th son. He was despised by the older brothers because his father favored him and had sent him apart with a coat of many colors. Ricky, did you have a coat of many colors growing up? No. (laughs) Or was it just because it was faded? (laughs) (laughs) They didn't have the right color patches. uh. So uh, he was set apart from all his brothers, right? They didn't like that. So they were going to make him pay a price. Um, so they were going to kill him. They decided they weren't going to kill him. They sold him as, as a slave. They sold him as a slave and uh, basically started from the bottom all the way up, right? Um, now as Americans, our culture is so different that it is hard for us to understand the severity of what these men did. Only killing him would have been worse. In biblical times, it is very important to have sons. A man's sons carried his name and inherited all he had. Joseph's brothers kept him from ever receiving his father's name and inheritance. They blotted out his name, completely stripping him of his identity. All that was familiar to Joseph was gone. Amen. Everything that he had, everything that he ever known was wiped out. And he was starting from scratch. See, but when we... Sometimes we think that when we become Christians, man, this is so hard because I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And, and like what I was telling you guys earlier, we focus on stuff we shouldn't be focusing on. Amen. Um, instead of saying, look, I'm set free. God has healed me. God did this, this, and this in my life. Amen. Imagine if, if we gave up our rights and just said, look, God, I want to see what you've done in my life. I was telling this guy from work, I said, imagine... How awesome it would be if people just realized that they didn't have any rights that w- they were, that th- that they think they have, right? If they just thanked God for everything they had, instead of thinking, "Well, it's my right that I get twenty dollars an hour, or it's my right that I get this, or it's my right that I get that," or, um, that's not a true Christian. True Christians don't have any rights, amen. We think of it as, as Americans, like uh, I was talking to a, a family member of mine. And I was telling them how um, the, the rights, are, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, that's not going to save us. Amen? Our right to bear arms is not going to save us. Right? Because in all reality, everything's going to collapse at one point. What's going to save us is, is God. Amen? Everybody gets so messed up with this whole thing with Trump. Trump wasn't our savior. And I, I believe that God let him get defeated because people were claiming him as a savior. Amen. Everybody thought that Trump was going to do this, this, and this, and this. And they forgot all about God. Amen. God is, was there way before Trump was. Amen. God was there way before science was. Amen. All this stuff that's going on in the world right now God has an answer for it, but we choose to look at the problem. 
Amen. And we get ourselves so messed up. And we, we, like Joseph, Joseph is going through all this stuff in his life right now. He just got sold into slavery. But his focus wasn't focused on the problem. His focus was on God. Amen. That's what's going to get us through all this stuff that happens in our lives. You know what? We are going to get offended sometimes. But we're going to suck it up and get over it. Just like Joseph did. Amen. We're not going to hold it in and get ourselves all messed up like a hip though. Amen. Because that's not what God, all this stuff that happened in Joseph's life, it was in order to break him so God could build him to what he needed him to be. Have we ever prayed and asked God, God, can you break me down and build me up like you need me? Amen. I pray that all the time. Because you know what? I can't, I know there's so much in my life that doesn't need to be there. Amen. Amen. There's pride, there's anger. There's bitterness that needs to get rooted out. Amen? Because all that area is an area where God should be growing in my life, but I choose to keep him out. Amen? <coughs> when a person was sold as a slave to another country, he remained a slave until he died. The woman he married would also be a slave, and his children would be slaves. So basically, he did away with his whole lineage, and he was going to be a slave for the rest of his life when they sold him. But you know what? God had another plan. Amen? Just like us, we were supposed to be slaves to the world forever. But God had another plan. Amen? Amen. Okay. So David eventually, he got sold to Potiphar. And Potiphar was one of the higher-ups in the, in the kingdom, so he started doing a lot of other things, and he started, and then Potiphar realized how God was blessing him, so he would tell him, you could do this, this, and this. And before you know it, he was in charge of everything except for his household. And then what happened? It all collapsed on him again. Potiphar's wife decided that she uh, wanted to sleep with David. And David ran like the Bible says to run, or Joseph, I'm sorry. <laughs> he tried, the Bible says to run away from temptation, and he ran, and he still got in trouble, right? So did he go to the pits and say, God, I did exactly what you told me to do, and I still got busted? Or did he say, God, I know this is in your plan? Amen. He didn't, he can't, we, he didn't get sucked into all the bad, right? He said, God, I know, I know you're going to work through this. Amen. We don't, he didn't, uh, when something happens in our lives, when this brother yelled at me, we don't, did we get sucked into it? Are we going to walk through it and say, man, maybe I just had to learn something there. Amen. She tried to seduce him daily. One day she, she was alone with him in the house and cornered him and insisted that he lie with her. He refused and ran out, leaving his robe in her clutched hand. When he did this, she was ashamed and screamed rape. Potiphar had Joseph thrown into the Pharaoh's prison. Now, Pharaoh's prison was nothing like the prisons in America. Mr. in several in a Pharaoh. No sunlight, no workout area, just a sunken room or pit void of light and warmth. Conditions rain from bring crude to dehumanizing. Prisoners were put there to rot as they survived on bread and water of affliction. They were given just enough food to survive so that they could suffer. According to Psalms 105, 18, Joseph's feet were hurt with fetters and he was laid in irons. He was put in the dungeon to die. Amen. He was never supposed to come out of there. He was supposed to die there. But then we're going to let him die quickly. They're going to do a slow and painful death, right? How many times do we look out back at what was going on in our lives and we were dying a slow and painful death? Amen. But God was trying to work through that and try to build us up to th through that, right? <coughs> um. Imagine... You're in this darkness, right? It's completely pitch black out there, moldy, wet, stinky. And uh, 
you have all the time in the world to think. Amen. How many times is us thinking the worst thing that could happen to us? <laughs> I know with me, I could sit there and if I start thinking about stuff, I can take myself into a bad spot in my life, in my head, right? Because there's just too much time to think. If I'm busy and I'm thinking about work and this and that, I don't have time to focus on the little stuff that I build up in my mind and make it bigger, way bigger than it should be. Um, but David, but Joseph didn't use his time to meditate on the bad. He, I think he used his time to meditate on the good, right? He meditated on what God was going to do in his life. He meditated on the dreams that he had, the visions that God show, showed him. And that's what's going to carry us through church, focusing on God. Amen. If we focus on the world and focus on what's happening here on earth, it's not going to get us anywhere. If we focus on heaven, focus on what is eternal, that's when God can use us. Amen. That's when God can grow us. Um, is God in control? I imagine that it never crossed Joseph's mind until it was all over that this was God's process to prepare him to rule. How would he use his future authority over those, these, those brothers who betrayed? Joseph was learning obedience by what he suffered. Amen? So when somebody offends you, when somebody gets in your face and does something, when somebody says this about you, re remember that Joseph was learning obedience through what he suffered. Amen. Suffering is part of Christianity. Suffering is part of life. Amen. And the way we look at it is how we're going to grow. Amen. We sit there and get offended and we get all messed up and we focus on that and, and don't want to look at anything else. We're not going to grow. We, we let God break us down and build us back up. We will grow. Amen. Um. I'm sure this kept ringing through Joseph's mind. I have lived in accordance to what I know of God. I have not transgressed his statutes or natures. I was only represent, repeating a dream God himself gave me. What, and what's the result? My brothers betray me. I am sold as a slave. My dad thinks I'm dead and never comes to Egypt to find me. To him, the bottom line was his brothers. They were the force that had thrown him into this dungeon. Maybe he entertained thoughts of how things would be different once he was in power when God put him in the position of authority he had seen in the dreams. How different it all would have been if his brothers had not aborted his future. How often do we hear our brothers and sisters fall into the same trap of assigning blame, for example. If it weren't for my wife, I would be in the ministry. She has hindered me and ruined so much of what I have dreamed. How many times do we look at what's happening in our lives and try to paint the bad things in our lives into somebody else? Amen. We say, man, this is holding me back. This, the pastor did this, and my wife did this, and that brother did this, and that's why I'm not growing. We need to focus on ourselves, church. The more we focus on ourselves, the more we focus on God, the more God can do in our lives. Amen. <laughs> I was ushering at the church in Lakewood one day and um, one of the ladies that was an usher and a couple other ladies were sitting there bad-mouthing these people, man. I mean, just <laughs> ripping into them. And this went on for about an hour, I guess, and I finally walked by and they were talking about somebody else and I lost it. They said, you know what, if you guys don't like these people, just leave. I said, nobody invited you and nobody invited you. I said, she invited you, but she wasn't supposed to. <laughs> I said, so just leave. I'm over this. I'm not going to listen to it anymore. And if you don't leave, I'm going to tell whoever you're talking about so they can make you leave. And they got up and left, and I felt bad a little bit. And then I thought, no, that's what happens, church, was we let this stuff grow in the church, and nobody does anything to stop it. Amen. We sit here, we care if we hear people talking bad about this person or that person or this person. And instead of stopping it, we don't say anything. And if we don't say anything, we're giving into that, right? 
we're part of that problem. Right? Or am I wrong? Right? There's only two sides of the bridge, right? You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Amen? It's just like Joseph. Joseph could think good or he think, think bad. Amen? Um, I want to emphasize the following point. Absolutely no man, woman, or child, or devil can ever get you out of the will of God. No one but God holds your destiny. Joseph's brothers tried hard to destroy the vision God gave him. They thought they had ended it for Joseph. They said out of their own mouths, Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. We shall, not, we shall see what will become of his dreams. Uh, they were out to destroy him. This wasn't an accident. It was deliberate. They wanted no chance of his ever succeeding. Imagine they had no intention of him ever living again. But when he seen him, did he kill him? He forgave him, right? They, ha they had nothing but bad things envisioned for him. And he forgave him. Somebody steps on our toe in the back of the church and we're ready to backslide, right? <laughs> He got offended. But these people, his brothers, were out to kill him. And he didn't get offended. Amen. Many Christians respond to crisis situations as if this is the exactly what transpires in heaven. Can you see, can you just see the Father saying to Jesus, Jesus, Jim just got fired because a fellow believer lied about him. What are we going to do? Do you have any position open down there? Or, or Jesus, Sally is 34 and not married yet. Do you have any available guys down there for her? The man I wanted her to marry just got married to her best friend <laughs> who gossiped about her and turned his heart away. It sounds absurd, yet the way we react initiates that this is the way we view God, right? We act like the way we act is it seems like that's exactly what God's trying to do to us. That's not the case, right? <coughs> um, but if Joseph, Joseph had actually had this attitude, God would have left him in the dungeon to rot. That's because if he had gotten out of prison with this motive, he would have killed the heads of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. This would include Judah, from whom, whose lineage Christ would descend right so he left him there and he took all this in but when he came out he was ready to face his brothers again right was God going to let him out of the, that dungeon if he was going to go wipe out half of Israel is God going to let us out of a dungeon if we're planning on sabotaging somebody or getting back at somebody for something that happened <laughs> that's uh it's a hard way to think about it, right? God knew what Joseph's brothers would do before they did it. As a matter of fact, the Lord knew they would do it before he gave Joseph the dream or before any of his, those boys were born. To go a step further... Look at what Joseph said to his brothers when they were reunited. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For those two years, the famine has been in the land. There are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a prosperity for you in the earth. <coughs> and save your lives by the great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Amen. How many times can we look at things that happen in our lives like that? Are we focused on the bad? Amen. Um, he had no anger to him at all. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't enraged. 
he had already given it all to God. Church, we got to learn how to give this stuff to God and not hold it and let it hinder our lives, hinder our walk with God. Amen. Um, not many have suffered the treatment Joseph received from his brothers. It would not have been as painful if his enemies did this, but these were his brothers, his flesh and blood. They were the ones who were supposed to encourage, support, defend, and care for him. Could there be a worse scenario of mistreatment than that which Joseph endured? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Can there be anything else that you could think of that have been worse than what Joseph went through? <laughs> I don't think so. Huh? One day, uh, um, my little cousin had hooked up with this guy, and the guy was a bad person, and he would uh, beat her up a lot. So me and my cousins, and uh, we would threaten him when we'd find him in town, and we'd chase him down and all kinds of stuff, and so one day she finally got mad at us and goes, you guys are ruining my life. <laughs> and my cousin told her, well, what are cousins for? <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's going to break you, it's going to be your family, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so more questions here at the end. Do you think Joseph had to work through any feelings of anger, hatred, bitterness, or revenge? Why or why not? What other emotions have you had to work through the result of being mistreated? Anybody want to answer that? Go ahead, sister. Why or why not? And then what other emotions have you had to work through as a result of being mistreated? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I think he was prideful too. He, he, uh, God was showing him what he was going to do, and I'm sure it went to his head, right? I think a lot of times it takes more time than we want it to take. You know what I mean? Um, it was years and years that he went through all this stuff. And, and sometimes we come to, to Christ and we want to be fixed overnight. Um, number two, in what ways can you personally identify with Joseph's story? How does his response and how he was rewarded give you hope and encouragement? <coughs> Anybody? I think with me, just touching back on one and then going into two, is what other emotions have you had to work through as a result of being mistreated? Um, when being mistreated for me, I, I lost trust. When going into to Numbers 2, I identified with the, with the story, you know what I mean, and how did his response and how he was rewarded be <coughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, go through that, go through all that, and, and ask you, how, you know, it's hard for me to trust people. And um, just reading that story and going through that, it, it just gives me that, that encouragement. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> I know, yeah, it's like for me, it's really easy to hold on to something because it's you become so familiar with it, right? Um, and you don't want to let it go. <coughs> Sister, did you have something? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think that's the the hardest thing like for me is like why am I going through this? It's what we think. But in all reality, God knows exactly what we have to go through, right? But we question him and we ask why all the time. Um I had a guy work me one time and he uh he went to school for like some type of uh computer science or something, couldn't find a job, so he started working with us. And every time I'd tell him to do something, he'd tell me why. I finally told him, dude, I don't know why, because somebody told me to do it, and that's come I told you to do it. I said, I didn't ask why, I just did it. <laughs> I said, so I have no answer for you no more, dude. <laughs> but I think that's how we got to look at it with God sometimes. Instead of asking why, just believe that he's doing what he needs to do in your life, right? <laughs> Jesus also suffered greatly. Why? What scripture says, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. What do the examples from Jesus and Joseph's life speak to you about the purpose of our hardships? Anybody? I think the purpose is there's a purpose behind all, all our hardships, right? And we got to believe that and know that um, instead of whining about it. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of times we we look at things that we go through and say, man, this has to stop and I'm going to make it stop instead of trusting God. You know what I mean? I was listening to somebody one day and he was talking about how we hinder our kids growing in Christ because we're ready to fix everything they're going through in our, their life. Right. If they have a problem at school, what are we going to do? We're going to go to the school. If they have a problem with somebody at the, at the church, we're going to go to the church and fix it for them. And they never learn how to what? trust God because we're always there. So do they need God? Not yet, right? Because they have us. And then when they become 18 years old, we're telling them, you got to trust God. 
Well, you never learn, let me learn how to trust God. <laughs> um, I'm going to read James 1, 2 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is de fully developed, you'll be perfect, complete, needing nothing. <coughs> um, look back over your life. Recall a situation in which you were hurt or mistreated or it seemed like the worst possible way. Can you see something positive about it now? that you, can't, you didn't see then? How did God prepare you to, back then for where you are now? Using what you learned, share some words of encouragement with those around you who may be get going through something with a similar difficulty. What, have, what did, you, did you learn as, that you were going through at one point and uh, what did you learn out of it, I guess? Anybody have anything to share? <laughs> and it was, was a blessing today because um, I've been working with this company for about 10 years now. And, um, you know, I, I, tra I, tra I travel with a lot of different people and been able to see a lot of different people that have been the same way that I had used to, the way I was. You know, and um, like today I was talking to my boss. I had to end up sending the guy home because he had a speaking out speech. Talking to my boss, and as I was talking to him, I was like, I'm not mad at the dude or even offended at the dude. I was like, man, I was like, I go, he just doesn't realize that I've been there, you know what I mean? Like, I know exactly how he feels and what, he, what he's going through, because I used to be like that. And he tells me, he goes, man, he goes, that's crazy. He goes, he says, I was thinking the same thing. He goes, when I was talking to him, he goes, this is the same conversation I was having with you on 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Have you guys ever done that with your kids? You're sitting there telling them something, and it's like, man, you remember your parents telling you exactly the same thing that you're telling your kid? <laughs> 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 All right, Pastor. 